Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service this morning <coughs> on this very first day of December and our first Sunday of our Advent period. Tony is still on leave, and um, most of you have Bob's number, and if you don't, it's up there. Uh, and and that, so I'm not sure whether they're away. The motorbike's not there today, so I presume they might have gone somewhere. I have one name tag to do for someone, which I haven't done yet because I've got to do two. But is there anyone here this morning for the very first time? Don't be shy if you, if you are. Well, you're not a first timer. Do you need a name tag or have you lost it? If you have, please put your name on, print it on a piece of paper and we'll do a, a new name tag for you. Eternity magazine came in for uh, it's December, January and February and that is at the entrance to the chapel. This one's not up there so I'm not going to change it. Tony did these flyers before he went away and left them up there for our lessons and carols. There are a hundred and something of them so please Take one, put it up on your fridge, put it somewhere. If you know someone you'd like to give it to, give it to them. And perhaps if you're a person who does your letterbox drop of mail, you might like to be able to put one up in your mail area for pe other people who don't come to chapel to see it. Many of you know that we support a couple of children in Uganda. Um, this is the girl that we support. She's in her second year of high school, and, or no, I'm not sure of their years, but she's been there two years. And there are a few letters that w Bob has run off that you can take to read of her, um, how she's going and a few things like that. The other one is of the boy that we have, and this is his first year there. And there are also um, a few letters from him that you can read. His hasn't come through as clear as, as Jaliat's, but um, you are able to read it and just find out a little bit more about what and how they are going. The next one are self-explanatory, but the grandfather may want to do something. Yes, hasn't had a cleaning up yet. <laughs> oh, Nan. The little stool, David didn't lean down far enough, so Miriam went and got that little stool to, and brought it over to stand on. That's our eldest daughter, Nerida, holding her latest niece. Ah. <laughs> They're going very well. I get to Skype each day and uh, don't get to cuddle yet, and you can't reach through the, the computer screen. But I'll be there in uh, three weeks' time or something like that. So good morning and welcome. Yes, as Daphne said, today is the first Sunday of Advent, the season of the ecclesiastical year when the church prepares to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. It's also a time when the church should engage in self-examination of his second coming, his second coming in glory to judge the living and the dead. As has been our custom over the last few years, we have an Advent wreath, or symbol of an Advent wreath with Advent candles. The Advent wreath is a Christian tradition that symbolises the passage of the four weeks of Advent. Uh, it is circular, if it was a big candle holder, it would be a big circular candle holder. And it holds typically five candles. And during the season of Advent, one candle on the wreath is lit each Sunday until all the candles, including the fifth candle, are lit on Christmas Day. Each candle actually represents an aspect of the spiritual preparation for the celebration of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Gwenda is going to come and share with us the first candle. The 
the candle of hope. The Gospel of John speaks of Christ as the true light coming into the world. In commemoration of that coming, we light candles leading to the Christmas and reflect on the coming of Christ. It's significant that the church has always used that language, the coming of Christ, because it speaks to a deep truth. Christ is coming. Christ is always coming, always entering a troubled world, a wounded heart. And so we light the first candle, the candle of hope, and dare to express our longing for peace, for healing, and the well-being of all creation. Loving God, as we enter this Advent season, we open all the dark places in our lives and memories to the healing light of Christ. Show us the creative power of hope. Prepare our hearts to be transformed by you, that we may walk in the light of Christ. Our call to worship today. Keep awake. Wait for the Lord. Prepare the way. Worship the Lord. Let us rejoice for the Lord is King. For our Lord in prayer. Let's pray. O loving God of light, come into our midst and comfort us 
your people who at times live in darkness. For some of us, the darkness is bearable, but we shouldn't have to endure it alone, O oh God. Help us know your loving presence. Help us feel your gracious peace. For others here, the darkness might be stifling and they can't find their way through its chaos. Help those who wander in darkness to reach out. Give them confidence to ask for help, God of hope, God of peace, God of joy. And as Advent moves forward, our minds are filled with thoughts of Christmas, thoughts of the story of light coming into our darkened world, thoughts of a little boy named Jesus. Open us now, Lord, to more than just thoughts. Open our hearts to the joy that awaits us this special season. Open our hearts to the real joy of Christmas, a joy that comes not in the presence we find under the Christmas tree, but in the presence of your light in our lives, the presence of your grace, the presence of your love. Almighty God, you warn us to read the signs for the coming of your glory. Christ Jesus, we pray for light and guidance in the darkness of our lives. And when we seek darkness, bring us to the light. When we walk the paths of injustice, guide us to your paths of love and mercy. When we sleep through life, awaken in us the desire to be your children. And forgive us for taking pleasure in destruction and for walking paths that distract others from your ways. Help us lay aside the works of darkness and put on the protection of your light and love. With hope, we pray for your gracious forgiveness and your wise counsel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So friends, hear the good news. Salvation is nearer to us now than when we first came to believe. The one who came as a child so long ago will awaken our hearts and give us peace to which we can say thanks be to God. Uh, Barry and Gwenda are going to bring us our readings today. This is a reading from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. This is what Isaiah son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hawks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war any more. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Thanks be to the word of God. The New Testament reading this morning is from Matthew 24, verses 36 to 44. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. 
and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day our Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's sing again. So as we've said, today, first Sunday of Advent, and therefore the first Sunday of the church year. And we begin year A of the cycle, which is Matthew's year. Now let me ask you, because someone asked me during the week, do you all know what the Revised Common Lectionary is? Okay. It's the guide for the church in its preaching uh, plan, if you like. It's a three-year cycle. Uh, As I say, today we're starting year A and what its aim is, is to take us through the Bible over a three-year cycle and we concentrate on three of the Gospels during uh, each year but interspersed with that, uh, the other Gospels also get a mention. There are four readings for each Sunday, so there are two from the Old Testament and there's two from the New Testament and It is a guide for us to have some sort of continuity of the story, if you like, 
those who preach don't have to follow it, uh, but it's a good guide and, and sometimes it, it enables us good continuity uh, for us to go through the year. So, we're starting. Year A, Matthew. When Gwenda read the scripture lesson, you may have noticed a couple of things. You may have noticed that we read a passage from near the end of Matthew. Come on, Bob, you've just said it's the beginning of the year. Why are we going to the back of the book? It may seem strange for us to do that. I mean, this book is the one that's going to guide us through our next church year. And yeah, should we be starting at the beginning? We don't actually read from near the beginning of, of the book until the fourth Sunday of Advent. The other thing you may have noticed about this passage is that it really doesn't sound much like Christmas, does it? it certainly isn't jolly and joyful. Nothing about it helps us to enter into the Christmas spirit. And certainly when we preachers use the lectionary, you know, we run into passages, passages of scripture that we might never think to preach on, especially on certain Sundays. And none of us might associate this particular passage with the first Sunday of Advent. Yet, the church encourages us to read this passage for today. So, let's see if we can follow the church's wisdom, trusting that we won't lose our Christmas spirit, but see it transformed. Matthew presents us with four small essays. Some commentators call them vignettes. Each is told with a minimum of detail. And to be honest, each essay seems intended to, to get our attention, if not to scare us. The four essays teach us something about what verse 36 calls that day and hour. This imposing phrase alludes back to the events described in verses 30 and 31, which tell us about an event or a promise or an assurance that permeates the whole of the New Testament. The way Matthew depicts this event is to say that the Son of Man will come on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And by saying it that way, Matthew gives us spectacular imagery of the risen Christ riding a cloud to enter again into our world. The imagery points to the reality that the future is in God's hands, not ours, God's hands. This word picture of Christ riding on the clouds assures us that God will intervene in the creation. Some other biblical writers talk about God's future for the creation in joyous terms. Let's go to Romans 8, Romans 8 verse 18. Paul talks about the glory about to be revealed to us. The glory about to be revealed. Not in our reading today. What about the author of 1 Peter when he writes of an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. These four essays, these four short stories remind us that God's decisive action in history will be a time of judgment as well. These four scenes that Matthew paints for us jumpstart our imaginations. Because they are concrete scenes with people in action, they actually draw us in. But friends, we need to be careful because these four stories intend to make us sweat and squirm a little in our seats. Getting ready for Christmas can make us feel that way anyhow. I mean, now Matthew makes us feel that way too. The first story, my tie today, Noah's Ark. We think of the beautiful rainbow, don't we? The promise of God. But you know there was a lot more that happened before that rainbow appeared. This first story is an allusion to Noah and the flood story in Genesis. And we know that story. But we often miss how terrible it really is. God was sorry for making human beings. God decided to drown the whole lot of us. But one family would be left. That's why he told Noah, go build the ark. Bring all the animals in. 
but the rest done. You know the rest of the story, don't you? Except for those on the ark, all the animals and people on earth drowned in the flood. As I said, this is a terrible story. Someone who reads this story without considering the whole context of the Bible might think that the image of God here comes disturbingly close to someone thought to be vindictive and revengeful, even insane. It's a lesson for us to never consider any part of the Bible in isolation. Matthew has Jesus say that this terrifying story helps us understand the coming of the Son of Man. In just a few sentences, Jesus paints a scene of, it's a scene of real terror. Jesus focuses on the part of the story that Genesis actually ignores. What it was like for people caught in the flood. Think back to the Poseidon adventure we, we spoke of last week. Our reading tells us that people were simply going about their business. They were eating lunch, might have been drinking a nice cold Diet Coke, nice flat white on the side. Where are you in this story? You might be rejoicing at the birth of a new grandchild. You might be planning a wedding. <coughs> Excuse me, John and Gwenda are going down to Melbourne next week, isn't it? For a, a wedding, John, Gwenda, yep. <coughs> Excuse me. All of those things sound rather innocent, don't they? Of course, being sceptical, we, we might expect some scenes of merchants, you know, cheating their customers, someone abusing the poor even. What we get is the judgment hitting us right as the coffee is being served, when we least expect it. We've no warning. The floods come down and sweep them all away. Let's go to another movie, Titanic. Some of the scenes in that movie, have, have you all watched Titanic? One of the versions at least? You know, some of the scenes in that movie, you know, with, with water crashing all around, the dead bodies floating everywhere, people screaming out, help me, help me. Well, these scenes may give us a bit of a mental picture of the scene Jesus describes here. Starting to squirm in your seats a little bit yet? The next two stories are very similar. With one sentence each, Jesus presents two pairs of people. In both scenes, the two people depicted are working hard at very tedious jobs. Two workers are out in the field. Two women are grinding meal. From each pair, one is received into God's new creation and one is left outside of it. These stories aren't quite as harsh as the first one. They don't threaten destruction. And I guess they offer more hope, at least for the one person in each pair who's received. Still, the story's heartbreaking. When God acts, when God reaches into the creation in grace and power, some will not be included. How lonely that sounds. Even a quick drowning might be more merciful than being turned away by God. And the last story, well, the last story doesn't make us feel any better than the first three. The only way we can understand God is to compare God to things that we know. Well, here, Jesus describes God breaking into our world with the image of a thief breaking into a house. Look, every minister at some stage counsels people who have been the victims of someone breaking into their home, of different crimes. You know, with burglary... The value of what we lose is only part of the problem. You can replace your computer, your DVD collection, your whatever. You can replace those things. But if someone breaks into our house, we feel violated. Has anyone had their home broken into? We have a couple of times. Not here. And you do. You feel violated. 
and it takes time to feel comfortable in your own home again. Even if Jesus is trying to make a point with this scene, the image he uses leaves us with an uneasy feeling in the pit of our stomach. These stories, they seem like the last thing we need to hear right as we're coming into this joyful Christmas season. Why do we need stories about floodwaters drowning people with no warning that the flood's coming? Or people being shut out by God? Or or thieves intruding into the place where we most want to feel safe? Let's just be honest, I guess, with ourselves. Christmas, Christmas is a difficult time. We've turned a blessing into a burden. There are so many of us who might find this time of year stressing us to the snapping point. You know, we rush around trying to buy presents, cook food, make travel arrangements, send out our cards and our letters. Who's who started doing all their Christmas cards yet? Because you don't want to leave it too late. Well, those of you who haven't, do you want to leave it too late? You know, we, all these things go through our mind. We stress ourselves out with just being prepared for Christmas without even thinking about what Christmas is about. I mean, even here, the singing group who, who are giving us wonderful support in all of our singing, uh, they're doing extra practice as well. You know, for some people, the holidays also can be the saddest time of the year. You know, lonely people are lonelier at Christmas. And what about if you've had a death in the family? This might be the first Christmas without that loved one. Christmas makes the loss stand out a bit more sometimes. I guess all of that leaves little time for the Christmas cheer. What we often try to do at Christmas is to hang on as best we can. We'll fill the holiday with, with all the trappings that show Christmas is in our home. Anyone started putting up their decorations yet? We normally wait until the 15th of December because so, that's Nerida's birthday, the eldest daughter you saw on the screen. We didn't want to confuse her birthday with Christmas. So Then it was a panic. We've got a week to get it all done. There are even those people who try to fake a little Christmas spirit, but you know, trying to paste on some Christmas cheer can just mask the emptiness inside of people. And then we try to fill that emptiness with some sentimentality. So maybe, just maybe, the lectionary committee knew what it was doing by assigning this text for the first Sunday of Advent. If these unsettling stories do nothing else, they tear away our attempts at simple sentimentality. Nothing at all about the Noah story, when you look at it all, is sentimental. Can we even think about God being as angry as that story sounds? Have you ever felt that you wanted to wipe out the world? Or perhaps just a little bit of it? Have you ever been that angry? Can you imagine God being that angry that he wanted to wipe out the world with the exception of one family? And you know, there's nothing sentimental about being excluded by God. Certainly there's nothing sentimental about a thief breaking into our house. And if we're going to hear one more rendition of jingle bells coming from our dashboards this season, we need Matthew to remind us that Christmas is about serious business. Christmas, friends, Christmas is about a God who aches over the sin of the world. We don't like to hear stories about judgment, but God's judgment means that God cares when people are hurt. These unsettling stories proclaim to us at the start of Advent that God hears the cries of the oppressed. He hears the cries of the abused. He hears the cries of the world's victims. Those are the things God judges. 
If God could come in a flood or like a thief in the night, then God is free to act and powerful enough to make us take notice. Matthew shows us that preparation for the season means more than making sure the presents are wrapped and you've made sure you've got the right name tag on it and it's going to the right place if you have to send it somewhere. Friends, we're called to discipleship and witness. We are called to obedience. We are called to resist the world's evil. Matthew is about more than judgment, of course. The fact that the floodwaters didn't come yesterday, means that God gives us time. Just a little bit after this passage is the familiar parable of the bridesmaids. You know, everyone falls asleep because the bridegroom's taken his time. After the word of judgment comes the word of hope. A candle for today. the word of forbearance, the word of grace. God holds the rushing waters back. The thief takes the night off. It gives us time to hear, to repent and to obey. We may not like it that God speaks right before Christmas through Jesus and Matthew with these frightening stories, but, but God needs to get our attention. We, friends, are the church. We are called to show and teach the world what it means that this baby is born. You know, we have more to do this Christmas season than we ever thought possible. We are the heralds of Christ. We are the ones who need to tell people that Jesus is the reason for the season, a season in which we will rejoice, but we're sad at the reason he had to come in the first place. Let us be the witnesses he has called us to be. Let us share the story. Let us be part of the story. Amen. Hark a herald voice. This is your chance to be a herald voice. hymns for us that just aren't nice to sing but really give us that true message. Yes, your free will offering will now be received.
loving God, we may not know the day or time of Christ's coming, but we know that it is time to wake from sleep. and praise. Receive the gifts of our hands and use them to bring light to the darkness and hope to places of despair. Through your Son, the Prince of Peace, we pray. Amen. Friends, our prayers of intercession. Let's pray. Dear, wonderful, loving God, we thank you that we can be here today to join together as part of your family, to join together in worship and praise and fellowship. We thank you, dear Lord, for all the blessings you give us. We thank you for the rain that you've been sending. Loving God, we desperately need more. Give us your blessing through rain. We need it, dear Lord, not just to fill our dams, but to give life to your earth. We need the rain to quench the fires. We need the rain to bring life through the soil, to bring life through streams and rivers, to bring clarity to our skies. But Lord, perhaps most of all, we need rain, refreshing rain, renewing rain, and cleansing rain. We pray for all those people who have been touched by the fires. We see many of them in our newspapers and on our TV screens for people who for many weeks now have been fighting fires, the people who have been supporting them, the people who have been part of the devastation of fires. Lord, help us to be there for them. We often say to each other, well, what, what can I do? It might be that we donate five dollars somewhere. It might be that we send some food somewhere. It might be that we pray that you will care for these people. Each one of us can do our bit, dear Lord. Give us the guidance, the courage and strength to do what you call us to do. We think of our families, particularly at this time of Christmas. Some of us will get to see families and some of us won't. We do pray, loving God, that whatever our circumstance is, that we will be able to, to share this time. And not just with those who share our name, but those who share our faith and those who share our world. A world you have given all of us, dear Lord. We pray for Tony and Gina as they spend another week on holidays. We pray, dear Lord, that if they're travelling around, particularly on a motorbike, that you'll keep them safe, return them to us safely. Restore them, give them a renewed energy as they too come back and prepare for Christmas in so many ways. Be with the people that they're visiting. 
may they receive joy as well. We think of those who, who share this place, those who manage, those who make decisions, those who, who have to fulfil the decisions that are made. It's not always easy loving God, particularly in a place as large as this. Can management make decisions that will please every person here? Reality says no. Do we think we could make those decisions that would please everyone? Reality says no. So help us to understand, dear Lord, when decisions are made. Help us to understand why they are being made. Help us to put them into the broader context of our village life. But yes, when we think wrongs are being done, help us to, to speak out as well. Help us to be there for each other and with each other. And so many other aspects of our village life, dear Lord. So many aspects which bring us joy. We thank you for all of our wonderful volunteers who do so much in this place. We thank you for those who aren't in a formal volunteer position but who do so much in this place. We thank you for those who visit. Because yes, dear Lord, as we spoke of earlier, there are some lonely people in our village and they may become lonelier at Christmas. Help us to seek them out. Help us to ease the loneliness. Help us to be there with them. We think of those who are not well. In particular, we think of our dear sister Jennifer who's, who's struggling a little bit at the moment, dear Lord. Watch over her. Care for her. Help us to be there for her. For the other people that we know of who aren't well, watch over them too. For the people who are in hospital, Watch over the care staff. Watch over the medical staff. Guide them, dear Lord. Help them to see what needs to be done. And for ourselves, dear Lord, as we prepare for Advent, help us to recognise the challenges of Christmas. Help us to understand the challenges of Christmas. Help us to meet the challenges of Christmas. And as we do, may we rejoice in the coming of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. As we celebrate his first coming, his birth, and as we recognise, dear Lord, that you will send him again at some time in the future, the day and hour which we don't know. So continue to bless us, continue to watch over us, to guide us, to strengthen us, to love us. We pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I, I know that I got to put some photos up. I encourage you too, if you have any special events that are happening, we'd like to share them with you. We'd like you to share them with us. So if you have any photos, or get your grandkids to send them, so that we can put your memories up too, so that together as a family we can rejoice in your happiness as well. Our word of mission today. Please join with me. Go forth in faith during this season of Advent and put on the armour of Christ's light.
Go forth in love during this time of waiting and embrace the peace that passes all understanding. Yes, friends, today, go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit being upon each and every one of you, now and always. Amen. Amen. Joy to the world.